If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Colossians 1. We're finishing chapter 1 this morning. And we're looking at verses 24 to 29, Paul's view of the ministry. We read the passage a few minutes ago, so I won't read through it again this morning or at this point. But let me pray for us as we look at the Word together. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Well, the ministry is a topic that was very dear to Paul. It was very close to him. He never lost his sense of wonder that God would call him to the ministry. And he never tired of talking about it in his different letters. Towards the end of his life, he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. It's very dear to him. Now, as we look at this passage this morning, it's my prayer that we won't do what we could be tempted to do, and that is to kind of disassociate ourselves from what Paul is saying here. Every Christian is a minister. In Ephesians chapter 4, which is the parallel passage to this one, Paul tells us that God gives to the church gifted people, evangelists, prophets, pastors, teachers, and so forth, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. So as a Christian, we are all being equipped for service. Now, and so I hope we'll just think about that as we go through these verses this morning. In our text, Paul shares with us eight aspects of his service, of his ministry. Let's look, first of all, then, at the source of the ministry. And we see that in the first part of verse 25. Paul says, Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. God was the one who had called Paul, called him out, who had set him apart for service. He says, I was made a minister. Becoming a, mem or a minister of Jesus Christ was not what Saul of Tarsus, prior to his conversion, uh, had on his mind, was it? It wasn't what he was meaning to do with his life. As a matter of fact, quite to the contrary, he had set out to destroy the church. But we all know what happened on the road to Damascus. He was blinded and terrified by the majesty of Christ's appearance. And all he could say in that moment when that happened was, what do I do, Lord? What would you have me do? And really, that should be our response as well. Think of Isaiah in chapter 6 when the angel of the Lord touches his lips with the burning coal. What does he say? Here I am, Lord. Send me. Every Christian has been gifted by God in unique ways and called by him to serve. Notice what Paul says. He says, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. Because God had sovereignly called him, Paul viewed his ministry, he viewed his service to the Lord as a stewardship. A stewardship from God. The word stewardship translates the Greek word oikonomia, 
which is a compound word made up of oikos, which is house, and nemian, which means to manage. And so it's the idea of managing a household as a steward of somebody else's possessions. I had the opportunity to do that when I was going through seminary. We, for two summers, when we were in Philadelphia, uh, we came back home and we house sat for a couple. They went off to the Northeast for the summer. And beautiful home, wonderful opportunity, but you know, the whole time I was there, I made extra special care and sure that I treated things just so. A steward, managing someone else's possession. God's call on your life, God's call on my life should be viewed the same way. He's called us, he's entrusted us with certain gifts and certain people. We're not our own. We belong to him now. Are we being a good steward of his calling on our lives with the gifts he's given us, with the relationships that he's given us? Secondly, we see the spirit of the ministry. Look at the first few words in verse 24. Paul says, Now I rejoice. I rejoice. The spirit of the ministry, the spirit of our service to God, is to be one of rejoicing. And as challenging and demanding as it may be at times, our service to God was never meant to be an arduous or an unbearable burden. Remember John's words in 1 John. Uh, <clears throat> this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. All right, so we shouldn't let circumstances or even other people, as hard as it can be at times, dictate our joy. Christian joy is in the heart. It's inside, it's internal. Certainly Paul was discouraged at times by his circumstances, but he maintained his joy. He described himself as afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, and struck down, but not destroyed in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Circumstances, Sometimes people, sometimes worry, anxiety, those can be the thieves that are eager to rob us of our joy in our service, but we can't let it be. So we see the source of our service, our ministry, God's call on our lives. We see the spirit of the ministry, joy. Thirdly, we see the suffering of the ministry. Look at verse 24 again. Now I rejoice, Paul says, in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. There's going to be hardships along the way that can come when we begin to invest, especially in people's lives. And many of you know that as well as I do. Paul certainly knew that. He was in prison at the time he wrote this letter. But he rejoiced in that because he knew that he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ ultimately. And not the Roman Empire. He considered it a privilege to suffer for the name of Christ, as did the early church. Remember what the apostles said in Acts chapter 5 after they had been beaten by the council and told not to preach anymore. Remember their response? It says they went on their way rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. When we're suffering, for the cause of Christ, we need to remember that God always has a purpose in it. 
We also need to remember that part of his call on our lives is to suffer. That's part of what we signed on for when we became Christians. Paul said to Philippian, to the Philippians in chapter 1 and verse 29, to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in it, but also to suffer for his sake. That's part of God's call on our lives. Now, I think one thing that can be helpful, and let's just pause for a minute and let me give you a few things to think about, is that in times of suffering, in times of hardship, think about some of the benefits of those times, those seasons that the Bible gives us. It all depends on how we respond. How we respond in those moments. Listen to this quote by Alistair Begg. He says, The truth is that more spiritual progress is made through failure and tears than success and laughter. I'm sure if we went around the room here this morning, many of us could share that, that that's been true in our lives. How we respond, so important. But let me share a couple other things that the Bible speaks of that give us perspective in times of suffering. First, suffering can bring us closer to the Lord. Suffering can bring us closer to the Lord. <clears throat> Paul said in Philippians 3.10 that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. Sufferings can give us a better understanding of what Jesus went through. He's called a man of sorrows, right? Acquainted with grief. It can bring us into closer communion with Him. Second, suffering assures us that we belong to Christ. It can play a significant role in your assurance of your salvation. Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Have you ever been shunned by someone you cared about or maybe someone you didn't care about or felt rejected by someone, family member, a group of people because you stood for Christ, because of your faith, your identity with Him. Peter told the Christians to whom he wrote, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed. You're blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you, 1 Peter 4.14. Times of suffering can cause us to sense the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives in that moment in a very special way. It reminds us who we belong to. Thirdly, remember that suffering brings with it a future reward. It brings with it a future reward. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Romans chapter 8. So those are just some thoughts. Those are just some of the perspectives the Bible tells us to maintain when we're suffering in our service to Christ. And again, it's so important how we react, how we respond. It makes all the difference in the world. Listen to this quote by Tim Keller. He says, The mark of wisdom is to be ready for suffering. If you aren't, you aren't competent with regard to the realities of life. But suffering is also a discipline for growth in wisdom. It can drive you toward God into greater love and strength or away from Him. 
into hardness of heart. You know, you think about the church, I've said this before, at large, not just, not here, but at large, every Lord's Day there's both in the church, right? Better people or bitter people. And the, what's the difference? How they responded. So, we see the source of Paul's ministry. We see the spirit of Paul's ministry. We see the sufferings of Paul's ministry. Fourthly, we see the scope of the ministry. Look at the last part of verse 25. That I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. Paul was a driven man, wasn't he? He was driven to fulfill his ministry, his calling. He told the Ephesian elders, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Now, that ministry for Paul consisted primarily of the preaching of the Word of God, of declaring the whole counsel and the whole purpose of God, according to Acts 20. But we too, again, let me bring us back home, like we looked at last week, have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. Every Christian has been given the ministry of of reconciliation, of proclaiming God's word to those in our circles of influence and relationships. What is the scope of ministry God has given us? Think about that. Let's think about that for a minute. Certainly, it, it's each other, right? Here in our congregation, in this church, but it's also our families our friends, our neighbors, our workmates. Are we carrying out the scope of the ministry that God has given us? Fifthly, we see the style of the ministry. Look at the first part of verse 28. And we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. How did Paul go about carrying out his ministry? What was his method? Well, he mentions three words in this verse. Proclaim, admonish, and teach. First, he says, we proclaim him. We're to do the same, right? We are to proclaim him everywhere we go. We're to proclaim him to people outside the church as the one through whom they can be forgiven, as the one through whom they can find peace with God, be reconciled to him, have eternal life in heaven, brought into a personal relationship with God. And we're to proclaim him to one another, to each other, Preaching the gospel is not just evangelism, but we're to preach the gospel to ourselves and among ourselves as the one in whom are all our resources. Christ dwells in us. Everything we need to grow spiritually is found in Christ. And each of us needs to know Him better and understand how to draw on the resources we have in Christ. Now the second word Paul uses in verse 28 is admonishing. He says admonishing every man. The word admonish is from the Greek word nutheo. We get nuthetic counseling from that word and it means to confront, to exhort and admonish. We set Jesus Christ up in front of one another as the standard. And then we exhort one another 
to strive towards that standard. It speaks of encouraging counsel, often in view of sin, and the consequences of sinful behavior. And so when necessary, we need to be willing to admonish one another. Look over at chapter 3 of Colossians and verse 16. Paul says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another. That's part of the method. That's part of what the body life should look like. Now, the third word Paul uses is teaching, back in verse 28 of chapter 1. Teaching every man with all wisdom, he says. This is sort of the positive side of admonishing. While admonishing is more corrective in nature, teaching refers to imparting positive truth. We're to go about teaching one another. Again, that's part of what healthy body life looks like when we come together on the Lord's Day. So we see the style of the ministry. It involves our, our service to the Lord. It involves proclaiming, admonishing, and teaching God's truth to others. Sixthly, we see the subject of the ministry. Look at verse 26 and 27. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations but has now been manifested to his saints, in whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what's to be our message? What's our subject? Well, the message that Paul proclaimed was the mystery which had been hidden from past generations, which he says is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, the Old Testament saints knew about Messiah and Him coming. What they didn't know is that He would dwell in us, that our bodies would be temples of the Holy Spirit, of the living God. And that's our subject today, that we share our message to others, that the God of the universe can live in you. And there's only one hope of glory. See, our message is a message of hope, not only for the present, but also for the future. That's the subject of our service or ministry. Seventh, we see the sum of the ministry. The sum of the ministry. Look at the last part of verse 28. That we may present every man complete in Christ. What was Paul's goal as he carried out his service. Well, it was that every person would be full grown, mature in Christ. He wants to bring the whole body of believers up to maturity. And part of bringing someone to maturity is getting them to the point of understanding that they too have a ministry. And seeing them go about carrying it out, like Paul did, admonishing, teaching, and presenting Christ to others. Are there people to whom we are trying to teach and bring to maturity in Christ? I mean, obviously, our children, grandchildren, would be a central focus. Who are we investing in? Is this a goal that we have to present every man complete in Christ? Well, we've seen the source of our service. We've seen the spirit of our service, the suffering of our service, the scope of our service, the subject 
of our service, the style of our service, and the sum of our service. Finally, let's look at the strength of our service. Verse 29. And for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Paul says that he labors. He labors. The word here, labor, translates the Greek word kopos, and it literally means to work to the point of exhaustion. The other word that Paul uses is striving, and that comes from the word agonizomai, and I bet you can guess our English word, agonize. It's an athletic term used in competing in an athletic event. Fruitfulness in serving the Lord like success in sports, it takes effort. It's going to take some effort, some discipline. That's the human side of it. That's human energy. If I'm going to be fruitful in my service to Christ, I must labor, I must work at it. Paul says, I labor at presenting every man mature in Christ. I agonize. He agonized over people in prayer for their souls. You throw Paul into prison, and that just gives him more time to pray more time to write, more time to counsel those who would come to see him, more time to work on the prisoners, the guards that were chained to him. Many of them came to Christ. They were stuck. They had to listen to him. But where did his strength come from? Where did his strength come from? Paul says that he worked to the point of exhaustion, but he wasn't exhausted. How can that be? Well, look at verse 29 again. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. It was the power of God at work in him. I like the way the Amplified New Testament paraphrases this verse. Striving with all the superhuman energy which he so mightily enkindles and works within me. You and I have that same power. We have that same power. Paul says it clearly in Ephesians. The power that God used when he raised Christ Jesus from the dead is now at our fingertips. Christ dwelling in us. But see, we have to daily, don't we, look to that power. We have to daily draw upon it. I want to close by sharing an Old Testament story with you, and you'll be very familiar with it. Remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and one of the first difficulties they encountered was the forces of Amalek. These forces came down and attacked them, Joshua and the troops went out to fight. Moses and Aaron and Hur went up on the mountain that overlooked the field of battle. And Moses held up the rod of God in the sight of the people. And when he held that rod up and the people on the battlefield looked to the rod, Israel prevailed. But when the rod came down... Amalek prevailed. So when Moses' arm got tired, Aaron and Hur held up his arm for him. Now what's that story all about? Well, the rod of God pictured the power of God. The authority of God and the power of God which the people of God have, see, but they have to look to it. They have to rely 
upon it. See, that's the winning combination. The winning combination is fighting with our eyes fixed on the power of God. And that's exactly how Paul went about his life and his service. Looking, relying on the power of Christ who dwelt in him to give him strength continually and to make him effective in impacting the people that he ministered to. So as we wrestle with these things in our own hearts this morning, I leave you with this passage in Isaiah chapter 40. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. That's the winning combination. Working hard while seeking the power of Christ daily to enable us to serve fruitfully. Amen.